I have a goal. I want to prove that 1 half factorial is equal to the square root of pi over 2, but I can't do that until I show you the Gaussian integral. This is the Gaussian integral. We have the integral from negative infinity to infinity of e to the negative x squared, and we're going to use that to show what this value is also going to be. Now, the Gaussian integral is extremely important like areas like stats and probability. This particular integral has a very neat result, and it's actually just the square root of pi, but I'm going to show you why that's the case. Now here's sort of how the graph looks. It looks something like this and you're trying to integrate or you're trying to find the area underneath the curve from negative infinity to infinity. And the problem with this is that it's not as easy as like a u substitution. So what we have to do is we have to create a double integral. Let me show you what I mean. We're gonna go ahead and multiply this or we're gonna square this. So let's just say for example, I'm gonna call this integral i. We have the integral from negative infinity to infinity, and then we have e to the negative x squared dx, and then we're going to square this. So what do we have? We basically have two different integrals. That means that this integral right here, negative infinity to infinity, e to the negative x squared dx, is simply going to be multiplied by another integral. Now, I'm going to change the variables here because, again, they're simply just variables. So I'm going to do negative y squared dy. Now, if we were to multiply these two together, you will see that we have a double integral. We have the integral from negative infinity to infinity times the integral from negative infinity to infinity of e to the negative x squared times e to the negative y squared dx dy. Now, putting these together will give us something like this. All I did was some exponent magic here and I grouped these together and it's still going to give me the same result. But let's talk about what this double integral actually represents. Just like a single variable represents the area underneath the curve, a double integral represents the volume of a shape. So let's just say you have a 3D image that looks something like this. So we're trying to find the volume of this shape that is bounded by the bottom. So let's look at the graph of this function. Well, if you were to graph it in the 3D plane, it looks sort of like this. You'll notice that it basically looks like a little pimple because it sticks out there in the middle. But the X values stretch from negative infinity to infinity and the Y values do as well. Now, just looking at the XY plane, imagine that the pimple, the three image is sticking out from your screen here. So we're actually looking at it from the top. The X goes from negative infinity to infinity and the Y value does the same. Now, integrating this is just as difficult as probably integrating a single one, but we have a beautiful relationship right here, X squared plus Y squared. So we're gonna use something called polar coordinates. Polar coordinates allows us to sort of move in circles. That's kind of the beauty of this. So you have a value R and it's this distance right here from the origin to some point. We don't know what that is yet. And the theta tells you that you're gonna be able to rotate about this X and Y plane. That's the beauty of polar coordinates. So we have this right here. Now the relationship is that X squared plus Y squared is equal to R squared. You can actually just see this by Pythagorean theorem. Let's just say this is X and this is Y, then you're gonna see that this is gonna be R. That's pretty simple. So this relationship X squared plus Y squared helps us in that particular case because now we know that that's gonna be R squared. Okay, so our double integral becomes e to the negative r squared. That's fine. But now we need to do something about the dx, dy, and then we need to change our parameters. Let's talk about our parameters first. Let's just say, for example, that I'm integrating or I want to start with r. Well, remember, this is the radius. And the radius, because I want to touch, I want to make sure I touch every single value on the x, y plane, the radius is going to start at zero and it's just gonna stretch on to infinity. Now, what that's gonna do is like, let's just imagine this stretches on forever. If I rotate it about the x, y plane, I'm covering every single value on the x, y plane if r is from zero to infinity, and then my theta is gonna be from zero to two pi. So my r is gonna be from zero to infinity, and my uh, theta is gonna be from zero to two pi. Now, once again, why is it two pi? Well, we start at zero degrees and then we rotate to two pi right there. Now, we changed everything in terms of r and theta, but what we need to do is we need to do something about the change of variables because we have x and y, and there's a nice way to account for this change of variables, and that's something called the Jacobian. Now, the Jacobian is defined as this. You have the partial derivative with respect to r, partial derivative with respect to theta, and then the partial derivative of y with respect to r, partial derivative of y with respect to theta. Now, the Jacobian basically tells you that 
our scaling factor for dx dy changes at a certain value or for a certain value and that's going to be the determinant of these values right here and that's going to be r so that's all we need to do whenever you're turning this into polar coordinates and you're dealing with double integrals the jacobian will always be r so we're going to go ahead and put an r here because now this tells us that our dr d theta is changing by the scaling factor of r that's what the jacobian does now we are able to integrate this we're going to go ahead and first integrate with respect to r so we're going to go ahead and use a u substitution okay so using a u substitution i made u is equal to r squared there's our differential du to r d theta and then i made sure that the variables stay the same so when r is equal to zero u is equal to zero when r is equal to infinity or approaching infinity u also approaches infinity so i have this integral right here I integrate this, giving me negative e to the negative u over 2, and I just go ahead and implement the first fundamental theorem of calculus. As it approaches infinity, because this is e to the negative infinity, that's 0, minus e to the 0, this becomes a positive 1 half. So now all I have to do is just integrate this right here, and that's pretty simple. This is just going to be 1 half theta. So what we have so far is we have uh, 1 half theta from 0 to 2 pi, and now we just go ahead and plug in 2 pi, and we get pi. That's it, we are almost done. Now keep in mind, pi is equal to this integral, which was squared. So I'm just gonna go ahead and take the square root and that's gonna tell me that the original integral, e to the negative x squared with respect to x is gonna equal to the square root of pi. This is amazing. Now let's go ahead and talk about this one. Well, because this function is even, you can definitely test that on your own, this function from zero to infinity is just gonna be half the amount of what we found. Well, that just means that the integral from zero to infinity of e to the negative x squared with respect to x is gonna be half of this value, which is square root of pi over two. And that, my friends, is how you find the Gaussian integral. And I'm hoping that made sense.